Um, before I hand it off to Will to officially kick off the first um, smart, smart Building Smart Cities Conference, um, I'd like for us to take a look at our, um, our sponsors for the technology conference. We wanna thank them so much for coming on um, for this first one. First, our presenting sponsor is LG Business Solutions. Um, our champion sponsor is Supporting Strategies in Los Angeles. Our participating sponsors are Hunter Douglas Architecture, HKS, and Anderson Barker Architects. And our media sponsor today is Arconnect. Uh, and now I am going to share a video. I'm actually gonna stop one second. I'm gonna share a video. Um, from our presenting sponsor, LG. Okay, thank you so much, LG. Um, just one other thing, uh, actually two other things I forgot to mention. Um, best viewing options today are in uh, speaker view, not gallery view. And also um, this event is being recorded and the recording will be shared with participants um, after the conference. So I believe on Friday. Okay, all right, thanks so much everyone. I'm handing off to Will. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Will Wright. I work for the Los Angeles chapter of the American Institute of Architects. And I really am delighted that we're gonna begin this program with the president of AIE Los Angeles, Wade Killifer. Wade will be uh, sharing a few brief remarks, but just so that you know a little bit more about Wade, um, five things that he has listed on his bio, quail, rugby, burpees, Joyce, and meatloaf. And I'm thinking Joyce there might be James Joyce because uh, Wade, believe it or not, has a Bachelor of Arts in English from Stanford University before he went on to uh, UCLA for architecture. Uh, Wade started his firm KFA Architecture in 1975 with his wife, Barbara. And uh, in 2006, he was elevated to the College of Fellows. And in 2016, his firm, uh, KFA Architecture, was named Firm of the Year by California AIA. Uh, Wade Killifer, welcome. Good morning. Thanks, Will. Um, we're excited that Smart Building Smart Cities, the first major AIA event of 2021, sets up our collective future as architects and designers, technology developers, policy makers, city builders, and community members. This symposium brings together a multidisciplinary perspective from thought leaders from throughout the world to share insight and best practices. Sweden, England, Hawaii, Chicago, New York, New Orleans, Houston, Nashville, Kansas City, Silicon Valley, and many other places are with us here today. No matter what your time zone is, welcome. The conference's first session today focuses on how smart buildings and smart cities can help us advance our goals to achieve more equitable and resilient outcomes. Tomorrow, we will share specific examples of tools, programs, approaches, and applications that we can leverage to implement these goals. 
We will also be applying lessons we are learning from the disparate impacts of the ongoing pandemic and connect those lessons to AIA LA's core values. Essentially, we will be examining opportunities for how a more integrated and connected building and a more responsive city can help make humans healthier, reduce our carbon footprint, improve our productivity, deliver greater joy, and most importantly, integrate nature and ecosystems back into our lives. This is just the beginning of a conversation. We aim to, aim to take deeper dives on all these subjects moving forward and identify more opportunities to connect and integrate our homes, offices, playgrounds, parks, and gardens with systems that prioritize and prioritize resilient and equitable outcomes for all to access and enjoy. Now I'd like to introduce our guide for the next two days and into the era of smart cities and smart buildings, Corey Brueger, AIA, Principal and Chief Technology Officer, HKS Inc. Corey. Thank you, Wade. And thank you all for joining us for the Smart Buildings Smart City Symposium presented by AIA Los Angeles. We have an exceptional lineup of speakers for you. It is my privilege to be on stage or rather on screen with each of them. Over the next two days, we're going to explore the challenges, the opportunities, and the outcomes attainable through the growth, progress, and development of intelligence in our buildings, our cities, and our infrastructure. As Wade mentioned, this is a starting point, the genesis of a broader conversation about the role of designers, architects, engineers, planners, developers, legislators, and technologists in the evolution of our built environment. Gone are the days of architects and builders strolling into town to deliver a standalone project and then riding off into the sunset like a cowboy in an old Western film. No matter the quality, the intentions, or the merit, our industry can no longer pat ourselves on the back for the individual successes of our projects. Stakes are too high and the challenges are too urgent. From climate change, resource scarcity, to economic disparity and social inequity, we each play a role in the health and prosperity of our cities and our communities. This is our opportunity today to leverage the, the opportunities that are afforded us with the evolution of social consciousness and the innovations in technology. Ultimately, this is an obligation for our profession. In these moments, I like to reference an excerpt from the AIA Code of Ethics, which states that members should thoughtfully consider the social and environment, environmental impact of their professional activities and exercise learned and uncompromised professional judgment. We should all let that sink in for a moment. The future of our cities is bright, but it requires that we collaborate to challenge the status quo. Today, we'll focus on the broader ideas, the opportunities and outcomes that we can achieve through smart buildings and smart cities. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker of the day, Indy Johar. Indy is the founder and director of Dark Matter Labs, a multidisciplinary design team working with partners, clients, and collaborators across the world to develop new working methods for system change. The underpinnings of his work are focused on the systemic constraints and the interrelationships that exist within any given area of research. This deep dive into connected systems is exactly the type of thinking that our industry needs to embrace as we venture into a new world of intelligent, responsive, and resilient cities. Thank you all. Indy, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you very much. I'm uh, really honored to be here. Uh, firstly, I've just been so impressed with the intro of this conversation um, that we've not got locked into sensors sensors and data inputs and BIM models and actually kind of embrace the structural issue that we're facing. Because I think smart cities as we've been interpreting them over the last 10 years, isn't necessarily the way we're going to have to deal with it in the next 10 years. And I think COVID was just the beginning of that conversation. So what I hope to do is give a mild provocation. Uh, you've got amazing speakers that follow that will really, I think, take a lot of deep dives into many of these conversations. So I'll try to be brief, but uh, precise into this, into this process. Okay, so I suppose I wanna, a lot of my our work has been focused on what I would call a boring revolution, the thing that sits in the deep dark spaces behind architecture as we formally know it. Um, dark Matter Labs, we're a 40 percent team operating from Montreal to South Korea um, we are uh, 
completely distributed uh, full time team, and we were part. We are part of Zero Zero, which I helped build in two thousand four, which is both an architectural organization, but we also helped build open source furniture company called Open Desk. We helped build open source um, housing company WikiHouse, which has multiple chapters around the world. Studio Weave, uh, Impact Hubs around the world, as well as actually Dark Matter Labs, which is the most recent framework. What I'm going to talk about is the institutional dark matter behind our cities. And the case I want to build is that the smartness of cities is not the smartness of buildings, but the smartness of our bureaucracy. It is the bureaucratic smartness that we're going to see which will transform our cities. And I want to make a case for us to start to think about those bureaucratic conditions and what they could open up in terms of possibility. But I also want to frame this through a larger context. Um, we already know the scale of the economic uh, disaster that, that we're facing, but also actually the number of lives that have been lost in, as a result of COVID, but also the massive social inequalities that have been seeded around the world. So when we talk about the rebirth of cities, I think we're at a moment when much of our conception of cities is going to be reorganized. Much of the sort of... Uh, thesis is uh, I, the data that I've seen is people are looking forward and saying COVID has kind of in, in a way accelerated the transformation that we were seeing in our urban economic geographies by about 10 years. At the same time, the climate change effects that we, we know are coming, actually the implications of those are significant and the social inequalities are actually massively accruing up against us. So when we talk about this, we have to start to think about the wider implications in play. And I think COVID has revealed many things. It's revealed the fragility of our existing system. It has revealed the systemic injustices or, or as it was in, in our economies, societies and, and cities. It has revealed um, the need to transfigure the relationships between ecosystem markets, states, households, and other, other frameworks. But it's also perhaps for me, heralded a kind of a new age of long emergencies. How do cities and places operate in an age of long emergencies and operating in a kind of suite of cascading risks that we're starting to see around our urban centers and have been seeing around our urban centers. And I think when we put this into situational context, I think we have to start to talk about the meta crises, whether it's nutrition decline in our food systems, whether it's entrenchment of inequality and the scaling of that, the diversity loss that we're starting to see, the environmental violence, uh, in terms of air pollution and other effects, sound pollution, light pollution, species extinctions, labor market auto automation, voter disenfranchise uh, disenfranchisement, and the debt crisis. And the reason why I bring these up is I think when you look at the world through this lens, I think when we talk about smart, I think smart cities become something else. And we have to understand that in many of these crises, the cause and effects are not linear, they're delayed and displaced. And the crisis has cascading impacts. There's no single simplistic villain. And it's driven by a multitude of actors to which we are all party. And I like sharing this because I think it's sort of visceral in what it reminds us that climate change is not something that's going to happen. It's been happening. And we're right now in the midst of it as we start to see temperature rise around the world. We're starting to see cities already. We're talking to uh, Milan, Madrid, who are talking about how do you build a ring of urban forests to deal with heat island effects? How do you deal with additional uh, flooding? What Are we going to build one and a half million dollar sewers or are we going to actually look at other formats of kind of sustainable urban drainage mechanisms? How do you incentivize them? Many of these things are going to require a level of smart engineering. Even if you're looking at trees, we're going to have to look at new ways of actually, we're, we're doing a lot of work around civic AI and the, the new ways of civic asset management and using machine learning capabilities, how do you start to organize them? So when we, when we talk about smart cities, it's in the context of vast scale of change. And at the same time, you know, recognizing the scale of the devastation, you know, of all the uh, mammals on earth, 84%, 96% are livestock and humans, 4% are wild, which is all the zebras in the world. And that's happened in 60 years. So the biodiversity loss that we're seeing what does that mean in terms of actually, are we talking about the rewilding of the planet? What does that mean in terms of our relationship to land? There's some fundamental questions which I'll bring up later in terms of property rights, land ownership and other models.
at the same time, what we're seeing is value is increasingly becoming intangible. This is, and we're moving from a tangible economy to an intangible economy. The value of social networks, the value of intangible goods and network infrastructures becomes more and more significant. So it is into this context that the world is changing. But underneath it all, what is also clear is that you know, this is the UK's net wealth chart. And what I think is most fascinating is that this is the net wealth of, uh, uh, of the UK, is that land is, has grown by far uh, more than any other asset class. And that, asset, that includes, just out of curiosity, you might be, you'll, be, uh, you, you'll enjoy learning, that it includes all the tech startups and everything else Land is by far the greatest accrual of value. So in an increasingly intangible world, the tangibility of land and the inequality that it drives is becoming increasingly a centerpiece of our conversation. And we as architects are sitting on that thesis. Labor market automation infrastructure that's happening. And these, for me, the reason why I bring this conversation up is I think when we talk about smart cities, we need to be framing it through that thesis. And we need to recognize that many of the challenges that we face Climate change in itself, or CO2, is a symptom of the problem. It is not the problem itself. The problem is a systematic failure in governance, in the externalities that we're creating in the world that are unaccounted for and unattributed. So whether it's plastic pollution or whether it's CO2, whether it's noise pollution or air pollution, these unaccounted for externalities are systemically um, driving much of the challenges that we face. And so if we want to talk about this, we have to start to talk about a deep code um, uh, redesign. And if we look at the kind of future destruction of common resources or liabilities, whether it's antibacterial resili resilience or chronic illness and loneliness, heat island effects, soil degradation, what we look at are underlying issues, which to do with effectively, why won't we spend enough on preventative health in our society? Well, currently our accounting infrastructure around the world doesn't acknowledge the power of preventative health. So when, when architects turn around and say, hey, we, we think we can make people's life better in terms of actually prevention, actually the institutional infrastructure, the accounting norms don't advance it. So architecture sits on a, architecture and urbanism sits on a series of rules and mechanisms that are increasingly out of date, which are going to be reinvented and rights and infrastructures. And the opportunity is to reinvent them in really radical formats. So the first sort of proposition I want, to, I want to put forward is that actually when we talk about smart, I think when we, we should be talking about the smartness of bureaucracy, the smartness of regulation, real-time regulation infrastructures, the reimagination of governance, we should be talking about smart property rights, what if they open up? new accounting mechanism, we should be talking about real-time system scale accounting and new forms of social norms where we can be talking about new ways of looking at analytics in which way we've not been used to. So when we start to talk about smart, I think we have to start to talk about smart cities from a much more structural lens as opposed to just the first front end. I'm going to give, give a few examples um, and we will have some time for questions and discussion as well. So this is really just an opener. So one of the things that we did do, we, we looked at the High Line in New York, for example. And many of you will know that the High Line in New York massively, I mean, I think we did the calculation, which was that it, it wrote, it, it, the High Line in New York cost something like 173 million US dollars. It, it increased property value that it would have paid for the high, the Highland would have paid for itself in less than 10 months, in less than 10 months, uh, if you just took 10% of the property value uplift attributable to it. So we did the modeling and what we've been looking at is all the way through to actually how do you construct a smart covenant? So a covenant infrastructure, which allows you to be able to lift, take the property uplift value and bring it back in to pay for civic goods. Why that's important is we are now able to contract many to many in a, in a remarkably efficient way. That opens up new ways of looking at value models of real estate in a way that was historically difficult. Historically, we've been using covenants in history, but now we can actually reduce the bureaucratic cost of them. So this starts to create a business model for civic goods in a way that was very difficult to achieve previously and increasingly complicated. This could be an emergent business model led by communities. At the same time, we can actually break up property rights and unbundle them in ways, whether it's actually around future development, land uplift value, resource rights, use rights, 
What happens when these become independent and differentially tax taxable? What happens when you start to be able to open up that token economy and land rights economy into new ways of operating? What happens when you start to link, actually the UK, in the UK, healthcare costs are largely, well, healthcare costs um, are massively driven actually by poor housing across the UK. So how do you link the value and the, the attribution of poor housing back into healthcare costs? What happens when you start to look at land value economies in quite different ways in terms of the liabilities they generate for third parties? And again, we're starting to see really interesting work, even in places like Oakland, which where, where you were seeing hospitals are starting to think about preventative investment in their local areas to be able to reduce acute uh, uh, acute emergency, emergency costs. We know the million dollar block work that was done in 2001, I think, across the US, which looked at urban, uh, the reoffending costs in a local local area um, and looked at how those reoffending re re costs could be actually uh, the over a million dollar cost in terms of penal, penal costs, how they could be invested again. So we know that preventive investment is starting to change some of these stories. And we're looking at whole city models of the, these variations, which look at, for example, Sofia, the city of Sofia is looking at 25 billion to do a full city retrofit based not just on a simple business model of real estate uplift and value, but actually the rich bit, uh, value models of job creation, which are taxable all the way through to prevention of certain issues on the table. So when we start to look at the, the real estate value model, you no longer talk about design costs, capital costs, operational costs at a maximum. You can also look at the total, total cost of delivering to the mission and the local economic multiplier. If we can now start to create business models which span that story, what options does it open up to the, map, to the future of architecture and how we operate? Two. There's some really interesting work going on around future of governance. Most of our governance theories are really based around actually rule-based rule -based systems of governance. What happens when you move them to machine rule-based systems all the way to machine learning rule-based systems and then machine to machine systems, which are self-governing in, in, in different formats. What will that do to building regulations? What will that do to actually how we operationalize our cities? How do we actually deal with that? Are we talking about Loosely, loosely uh, coupled systems, loosely bound systems, which is what we currently have, uh, to tightly bound systems, where if you drive over 30, 30 miles per hour, your, your, your car automatically slows down. Or are we talking about new forms of ennoblement systems, which are actually looking to support people to make better decisions as opposed to control them? What is the governance architecture of how we govern urbanism? We'll, give, uh, we'll redefine our relationship with humans, uh, each other, but also redefine the relationship with the city. How does that open up new ways of regulating our city, which opens up dynamic models of regulation in a way that's historically not been possible? New forms of local permission mechanisms. How does that change the nature of how we zone and plan our city if we, open, if we transform these things? All the way through to ownership models. Obviously, we did a lot of work around 3D printing of housing, but one of the most interesting stuff that we've been doing is now looking at new models of material registries and how do you actually create circular economies around those material infrastructures. What does that start to mean to the house, which is actually a bundle of services as opposed to a single product with the materials being owned by the suppliers? So what you start to create is a new type of uh, model in terms of actually material recycling incentives and other formats. How do you deal with the smart leasing and warranty of those infrastructures? How do you deal with many of the um, third party issues, which is to do with uh, around the self-sovereignty of housing. We're doing a piece of work around a house of self-owning and what does that start to do in terms of actually stewardship models, new forms of funding models, for example, smart perpetual bonds, which finance those. And that opens up other forms of domains, which I mentioned about natural infrastructure. How do we talk about the CO2 value of natural infrastructure, also the biodiversity value, also the sustainable urban drainage value? How do we start to look at these sort of nature-based economies. The UK has just released its first report on the nature-based economy and how to sort of operationalize it. I think these sort of things will massively change how we look at, uh, look at operating the city. Now, that applies in terms of our regulatory infrastructures. We're working with Montreal City, for example, looking at forms of regulatory sandboxes. What are the regulatory sandboxes we can develop, which allow for new forms of regulations to be co-engineered with the startups and new material products, as well as the new mechanisms of operating that we're starting to see. How to build legitimacy and transparency between those processes is gonna be key. So 
what I wanted to show there was that, and I think, and I hope over the next few days, we're gonna get into some of these conversations, is that the kind of smartness of the city is a multi-dimensional smartness. And um, when we talk about it, it's the future of rights, it's the future of policy infrastructure, it's the future of contracting, and it's the future of how we license the city. And these are all going to be transformed as a result of these uh, frameworks. But at the centerpiece of this is actually also a fundamental question of how we re-understand ourselves as being human. We have to re-understand ourselves as biological multitudes. We know that most of the data is saying we're not a single entity, we're a multitude of organisms which cohabit, where the human DNA is actually a fraction of what our body has. There's all sorts of other symbiotic DNA structures which cohabit with us. Our contextual identity, uh, in, both in terms of epigenetics and how we are linked into our context, also with our relationships. The conflicts of our identity systems, we're not a single identity, we're multiple identities coexisting. Quantum materiality in terms of actually how we exist in a kind of vast field of entanglement to even the thesis of the social brain and how our brain networks work. So if we're going to reimagine the smart city, it's really vital that we re-acknowledge re the science and the policy that's reimagining us as humans in that thesis. And that's this has been going on. The research has been has been building for many years, whether it's intergenerational ep ep uh, epigenetics or how, how financial scarcity um, undermines IQ up to 30 IQ points and sort of as a result of financial stresses, biological multitude, we've talked about gut, the gut, uh, gut and microbiome influences. We know the work that's been done around microbiomes um, microbiomes in all the richest neighborhoods in the world are very, very similar, which we'll start to talk about how we under considered the thesis of microbiomes and their, and their human context all the way to the impacts of long-term long -term emotional scars. How do you build a city which is actually about care and emotional wealth is gonna be really, really critical in terms of being able to do that. And obviously the most critical work for me and some of the best work, Dr. David R. Williams's work on the role of kind of how, how racism fundamentally does micro, uh, attributes microviolence with, uh, into our bodies, microforms, everyday words, which actually increase cortisol levels high levels of risk and cardiovascular disease. So when we talk about change, it is not change that just happens in the material world. It's change in how we lead, change in how we operationalize, change in how we contract, change in how we relate to our employees, change in these things are also gonna be critical if we're gonna build the city of tomorrow. And I say this stuff because I think we need to start to think about a deeper level of change. And I'm slowly coming to an end, or quickly actually, is that, I think we're at the precipice of a much more structural transition, a transition which looks at the nature of our human development, our relationship with nature, which is fundamentally that of resource, is going to become much more about cohabitation. We're doing some interesting work, well, I think amazing work, with Indigenous nations in Canada, looking at new forms of uh, transferring from property rights to actually micro treaties with nature. New forms of, uh, we also need to look at new forms of stewardship for our material economy. What does stewardship look like as opposed to ownership? How do we start to operationalize it? And then societies, how do we think about the future? How do we organize for the future? How do we acknowledge the risks we generate for future generations? And it's at that scale that we start to think about human development in a fundamentally different way. Long-term societies, in terms of what does long-termism look like when we start to plan cities for 50 years, 100 years, what does it look like when we start to talk about natural assets economies in fundamentally different formats? How do, we, how do we behave and operationalize the idea of stewardship into our material economy, into our housing economy, uh, into that thesis? And how do we start to change our relationship to things, humans, nature, future? And the technology part is key. And this is where I come to an end. I think the technology part is fundamentally transfiguring our relationship with all the world around us. So smart cities is not a linear continuation of what the world we have. It is actually a fundamental reconfiguration of those relationships. And that I think is gonna give birth to quite radical geography of living that I think we're only at the beginning of seeing. With that, I'll come to a, a, a quick end, recognizing it's a, I probably overstayed my time as well in that process, but I wanted to open it up. And I suppose the privilege of being first is to actually open up this conversation to say, you are architects, you drive change, you drive change into material places, and you have a fantastic AIA code of 
code of ethics, which is one of the best in the world, actually, in terms of actually driving the story. I think architecture sits at the beginning point of quite radical change. And I think that the radicality isn't going to be about sensors on doors, and it isn't going to be about large screens. It's going to be about fundamental reconfigurations of the relationships we have with our materiality and the world around us. So with that, I really thank you, and I, I profusely apologize if I've gone on too long. Indy, thank you so much. You know, I, th I, I couldn't think of a better way to open up the symposium. At the end of the day, when we look at the opportunity we have to change the built environment, to change social economic construct, um, it, it is a, a multidisciplinary and, and really interconnected systemic change that we're looking for. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of times architects tend to um, look at, at, at their silo of work that, that we don't necessarily have the influence when we look at, um, you know, colonial development, you know, the, the history of how land rights have come into play, the regulatory bodies that, that really drive what development look like, looks like. And then obviously the, the constraints of a, of, of a capitalist system that, that drives economic growth and development. But at the end of the day, I, I do think that, you know, smart cities become very siloed interventions without that systemic change. And I'd be curious, you know, in the context, when you look at it from cities, we always get caught between either we change through innovation and through uh, becoming a driving force, or we wait for regulatory bodies to catch up and to drive that change. Um, I'd love to hear your, your take on, you know, why it's important for us not to wait for regulations. For me, I think we should be leading the conversation on, I think cities are gonna go through massive transformations. I th you know, whether you're looking at New York, whether you're looking at London, I live in London, London, UK. And I think London will not be anything like the city it was for the last 50 years. So firstly, and regulation is always lagging in this story. And for me, regulation is about, we, regulation is about the preservation of public good. And if I go back to my original thesis that climate change is a symptom of a failure, right? CO2 is not the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. It's a symptom of actually a world where we are being polluting the world through externalities, which are now feedbacking into us and self-terminating us. So when we talk about this, we often get seduced by people saying, oh, it's carbon, it's carbon, it's carbon. Carbon is just a symptom. And if we solve carbon, biodiversity loss sits right behind it, which will be self-terminating. So for me, governance is an innovation space. It's a space of how we govern together is almost vital if we're going to survive as a species. And the, if we look at any of that stuff, so I see it as, and governance is not a, not a holding back. We often see it as a constraint. And I think we have to see it as a mechanism to actually live together, not as a constraint architecture. We have to see it as a mechanism to actually allow us to advance together, recognizing a world of externality. So, we see it as a space of innovation. We see it as a place of, I think the whole dichotomy of public and private has become increasingly problematic. The idea there is, a, you know, none of our houses are gonna survive in a hundred years or 150 years if we go through anywhere near the scale of un, uncontrolled climate change that we're gonna have. Largely because we'll have runaway social crises. So the idea that we can isolate ourselves from many of these crises is part of the illusion. And the idea there is private in that thesis becomes part of the problem. We are part of an interconnected crisis. And I think we have to start to build and operationalize that way. And we have to construct legitimacy into that thesis. So I see, we see regulation and governance as a fundamental tool and a mechanism to actually operationalize uh, some of the change. And innovation is happening there, massive amounts of innovation. And we're gonna see huge amounts of it. Like I say, I think we're at the paradigm of a bureaucratic transformation. Bureaucracy was constructed as we know it at the time of the, uh, the Kaiser. And we're about to transform our thesis on bureaucracy. And in, in, in essence, that is going to transform the city. It's gonna transform the city in radical ways of how we control and self-regulate and self-govern. So a hint at it, I, there's lots more to go into detail. I, I recognize those questions also coming at it, Corey. 
Thank you so much. I think, Will, we can open it up to some other questions here. We have about 10 minutes left. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Giannis, you're on the, on the line. Do you have a question? You want to go first? Well, we're waiting for uh, Giannis. Let's go to Nima. Nima, welcome. Hi, sorry. Um, so my question involves um, our pushback as architects, innovators, and designers um, by the government. Although government always uh, um, gives us incentives and help us innovate and um, offer innovation incentives, of course, um, at the same time, a lot of the um, points being made are about a change in regulations and how privatizing actually is and technically publicizing, but how's the government is going to respond to that? Um, for example, given the social climate at the moment, um, we are seeing a lot of the Western governments um, caught in between corporate involvement um, and um, old dated regulations and basically stalling. Um, and how, how can we move forward um, as mentioned, if governments um, basically don't know what they're doing at this point? since there's such a pushback on both sides? I think it's a really good question. So the, there is huge amounts of lock-in into our current economy, and that's gonna pull that, pull, uh, drive that lock, um, sort of that stasis. At the same time, what I'm seeing cities do is turn around and talk about sandboxes and saying, how do we open up the regulatory domain in discrete zones? So in, uh, in areas where actually you can start to open up these regulations. The question is, is that a deregulation thesis or is that a new regulation thesis? So people often talk about actually burning the regulations. Regulations aren't the problem. What we need to do is invent them again. And so if you can build the capacity of cities to be able to imagine uh, smart regulations or code re uh, regulations as code, we will start to create new frameworks of how we organize our cities, how we regulate and, and govern them. So it's actually rebuilding the power to innovate regulation is going to be fundamental ally to us. And I, I would say we're seeing it as a hopeful, hopeful space. So we're seeing multiple cities start to take that sort of approach, recognizing the current model doesn't work, recognizing embodied carbon uh, registries actually are really difficult to put together. How do we regulate them? What is the new economy? What do those frameworks look like? And these are all have to be discovered. And they're going to have to be discovered with radical transparency and operationalization of that over a period of time. So I think we'll see cities open up clear spaces of operation in being able to do that. That's what we're seeing emerge. So embodied carbon is a really, really good one. And material registries are a really key component. So we'll see small spaces of operation which start to link those theses together. Hope that's helpful. Thank you. We have a question from Aaron. Aaron Paglioni. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Um, you started to address this question actually with your last answer, but do you think that um, this will happen as a series of incremental changes over a longer period of time or as more of a, um, <clears throat> like a very quick revolution? Um, and if so, if it's more incremental, how do you think that will happen? It's going to happen at multiple speeds. Um, so I, I think that so it's going to happen at multiple speeds at multiple locations. So I think the nature based economy conversation is going to happen quite fast. It's already happening, happening at speed. So we're seeing cities talk about $400 million uh, worth of investment looking at planting urban forests, and all sorts of stuff. So some things are going to happen at speed. At the same time, I think some things in terms of actually um, looking at property rights transformations, I don't see that being hap happening in the current economy because so much of our land value and value is locked into that. Whereas actually what you might find is in business communities, we're gonna see some really rapid innovations in a way that we've never imagined before. So I think the leadership for that will happen in different locations. So my thesis more and more is that certain parts of, of society will lead on certain parts of that thesis, not in a single monolithic whole, because I, I just don't think we, we, the lock-in will be different. And uh, we're already seeing, you know, we're working in Canada, we're seeing some really amazing, uh, amazing indigenous leaders that starting to think about transforming that property rights economy into a new model. And what does that, what does that look like? How do we relate to that? How do we govern into that? So we are starting to see some of these things come together. 
I think, you know, I would say self-sovereign piece of architecture is going to be really interesting. When we start to see architecture not owned, but being self-owning public infrastructure, which is actually then um, offered for stewardship, I think there's something very interesting in what that does to the idea of architecture itself. And I think that will be a transcendent moment in our economy of architecture and urbanism. So we're doing some work around the free house and how you structure and model those things, both in terms of smart perpetual bonds, material ownership, and repair economies and stewardship agreements. There's a, I, you know, I'm, I think that's really interesting. And that I think can be done now. We don't have to wait for, for the regulatory infrastructure to catch up to it. So there's some of these things that are already coming to play and near and near about. So it's a bit of hybrid regulatory stuff. We're gonna to start to see my worry with the regulatory stuff is we use technology to drive greater control, right? So when technology is used to actually create greater control that becomes a problem. Whereas you can also use technology to drive greater ennoblement. We know this with judges. For example, if you tell judges, uh, if you give judges, um, if you use machine uh, learning to be able to say to judges, don't make those uh, recommendations, they typically react really badly. Whereas if you say your recommendation sits on a gradient of this and you are here, they tend to self-correct. So how do we create governance mechanisms which ennoble us? And what is the thesis of ennoblement in that I think is really important. And I think that's not a soft woolly idea. It's about information feedbacks, control systems, social recognition systems, and how do you build that transparency for people to actually decentralize in a decentralized manner, be able to advance those positions. Thank you. So we have a question from Rick Guttner. And Rick, while you're on the line, we'll go to Giannis after Rick. Thank you so much. This, this is a super interesting topic and, I, and it's a really great way to lead it off. My question is, are there other case studies around the smart covenant you talked about relative to the High Line as a way to, because we're talking a lot about the transformational power of data to tell us what's happening to the property that we can bring community benefit, right? Are there other examples or case studies we can use to educate our local political leaders and business leaders on that? Uh, there are loads of examples in different parts of the world, uh, whether it's, um, and we've, so the US is, I mean, New York is fabulously good because it does annual valuations. So you can scrape the data uh, very quickly, which is what we did. And then models, we, we ended up building a topographic model of land value and its fluctuations. So we could discount for new interventions that came in and actually taper them off on the topographic valuations. So we were actually doing the live modeling of that. Um, I've, I've, what we're seeing is you can do it with forests. So a tree-lined street uh, put seven to ten thousand dollars on a house. Um, we're seeing uh, schools put seventy to hundred, seventy to hundred thousand pounds on a house. So we see civic assets. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do. I'll do a, um, there's a little trick, right? So if I was to take my house in London and put it in the middle of Nova Scotia, how much is it worth? Not very much. The utility value of the house in Nova Scotia is slightly less than London. So what you find is that the house, the, the house, a house's value is a function of its access. And increasing access value has is attributable to all these social and civic goods and utilities. So we've been over, we've been privatizing all that value into the private public private, the private property and underplaying many of these things in terms of their relational value. So I think we're seeing a rebalancing of that economy. It's not undermining the private private property. I don't know about the US, but one of the big conversations happening here is something like 63% of our net wealth is, is, is in housing. And that's a problem because we're not moving it into the innovation space. So that needs to be in the productive sector of our economy. And so those are whole new conversations starting to emerge about how we balance these things up. And I think there's gonna be, for me, um, there are the relationship between civic goods and private goods will be reestablished. I think civic investment is now possible as a business case model. So we're doing a lot of work around that. You can look it up on our website on new civic, uh, civic investment architectures that goes from trees to school and social infrastructures like Park Street City, all the way through to actual uh, uh, green infrastructure and, um, uh, and uh, institutions like the High Line. So I think that's a, a new type of business model made possible by the ability to do many-to-many -many contracts. 
So when you can do a thousand to thousand contracting, you start to change the domain of operation and value construction. So yeah, I mean, there's lots of examples on uh, on uh, on our. We, we we tend to blog relatively openly, so uh, there's lots of stuff we put up in the public domain for sharing. And happy to reach out afterwards as well. Perfect. <clears throat> We've got time for one more question, and this one was from Yanis. Um, his mic isn't working, so I'll read it for him. I would also like. To Randy, to expand on the non-rivalry economy. Does that mean that the abolition of monetary exchange? I cannot see how such an economy can be implemented without price discovery and competition, thus everything is provided without the needed input of humans, which seems to me a contradiction since all the technology that we would enable such an ideal condition is controlled and created by humans. I don't see tech companies, for example, forfeiting their trillion dollar market capitalization. No, it's a, it's a really fair point, I, and it's a really good way to end this conversation as well, on a, on what I think is a big question for us, that rivalrousness as a mechanism of innovation is only one theory of innovation. So if we believe that we will create greater value through rivalry, that's one theory of organizing. There is really lots of uh, really interesting work, actually from lots of really brilliant thinkers in the US um, who have been talking a lot about as, as we now enter a new age where we become globally interdependent, do we need to operationalize a new thesis of value creation, which is based on non-rivalry? When you have multiple nuclear weapons and multiple nuclear arsenals and ability to destroy ourselves, is rivalry the mechanism of evolution? And there's some really interesting questions, and I would point you to people like uh, some, some of the people in, in behind the portal, uh, which are talking about Eric Weinstein's first talk with um, Daniel Schuttenberger, which I think is a really interesting talk that really gets into some of these conversations. And I, I bring them up because I wonder whether architecture itself is a rivalrous affair. So if you build a building, the business model of a building is between seven to eight years, nine years maybe, but actually the maybe 10 years. But actually the reality is the building will last about 100 years, if not more. So architecture itself outstrips the business model which constructs it, which makes it a quasi-public good in terms of both costs, liabilities, and value creation. So when we start to think about architecture, are we creating it for a rivalrous economy? Or are we creating it for a public good economy? What does that mean? How do we operationalize value? And I think there's, there's a big conversation starting about monetary policy and other things, which I can also see knocking out. I do think we need to start to think about architecture housing is not a market problem. I think housing is an infrastructure problem. And I think we have to start to think about housing as the mechanism to unlock the value of society, not as a market device to effectively operationalize value into the economy. So if we start to think about an advanced human economy, would you be talking about housing as a market device or would you seeing it as the infrastructure to unlock the full potential of humanity? And we've done that with water, we've done that with other utilities. So the question becomes, what are we starting to, start to think about? And I think these sort of structural challenges are gonna be upon us, whether it's through UBI or other mechanisms, which I think will open up some really interesting discussions. And that's where I sort of opened up the whole thesis around a free house, a house which is self-owning for public good. What does that do to our nature of investment and how we organize the city in that thesis? And I think we need to have more fundamental conversations about that. Those things for me are coming. And that doesn't mean there's no private capital involved. You can still have private capital, you can still get an ROI in that private capital, but the utility function is for public good in that, in that thesis. Perfect, uh, thank you very much, Indy. Really appreciate the insights in the presentation. Um, we do have to move on to, to try to maintain schedule. So I'm gonna go here, uh, go ahead and pass it over to Corinne. Um, and uh, thank you all so much for your questions and, and Indy for your presentation. My pleasure. Thank you, Corey, and thank you, Indy. Um, we are here with the AIA Los Angeles to thank our annual sponsors, and it's our annual sponsors that really help um, provide the support and the leadership and the input to make a, a successful program like this happen. Um, our gold sponsor for the year is Gruen Associates. Our silver annual sponsors are LG Business Solutions, 
Lair Architects, LA, HKS, KAA, SOM, ZGF. And our bronze sponsors for the year are Collins Collins, Murin Stewart, Clark Construction, John A. Martin and Associates, KFA Architecture, Bernard's, And with our sponsorships right now, we have a great opportunity to support more of our chapter. And uh, the program sponsors will be shared next by Kareen. Thank you. And I'd like to also uh, honor Woods Baggett, one of our annual sponsors. And we're, we're delighted to have one of the Woods Baggett um, uh, pr principals on our board of directors this year. So Kareen, do you wanna play the, the, the next set of slides? Can you see it now? Were you guys able to see this slide earlier? Yes, okay, great. Yes, this is again, we wanna thank our um, sponsors for the technology conference, um, Smart Building, Smart Cities, our presenting sponsor, LG Business Solutions, champion sponsors, supporting strategies, Los Angeles, participating sponsors, Hunter Douglas Architecture, HKS, Anderson Barker Architects, and media sponsor, Arconnect. Uh, thank you so much. Perfect. And with that, I think we'll move on to our first panel for the day. Um, in our first panel, we will explore the role of smart buildings and smart cities in promoting and attaining sustainable and sustainability and resiliency in the built environment. 2020 showed us the fragility of our built and societal constructs. It highlighted the interconnectivity of our global markets and the interdependency of our economic and social systems. It also exaggerated the shortcomings that exist in each of these systems, allowing the most vulnerable populations to slip further into the background. These were not con conscious decisions. They're the consequence of years of neglect from economic, social, and environmental policies that were and still are viewed through a narrow lens. As we move into a connected and global future, we'll inevitably be dependent on the exchange of ideas, free sharing of information, and a combined decision-making process. The benefits of this way of thinking and doing will ultimately change the scope of what we deliver as a profession. The foundational opportunity for us will be the opportunity to design and build cities that are resilient and sustainable, socially, economically, consciously and environmentally. With that, I would like to turn it over to our panelists to give us a quick introduction to themselves and to their companies. Thank you. Well, Corey, I, I'll assume I'll go first. I was first on the list. This is Dave Lowe with uh, Agatewood Consulting. I'm the executive director of the 2030 Districts Network. Um, just a real quick intro. Um, the, the 2030 Districts Network um, is a organization. We have 23 uh, 2030 districts located around the U.S. and Canada now. Uh, 2030 district um, is uh, an organization uh, we like to call it a a, a Private public partnership. Um, an organization started uh, in the public in the private sector by building owners, managers, um, uh, working together with professional stakeholders, architects, engineers, etc., et um, and community organizations, all working to uh, save energy, um, water, and transportation emissions. Uh, within a, a distinct boundary in a, in a downtown core. So we started the first uh, 2030 district in Seattle back in 2011. As I mentioned right now, we have 23 different uh, 2030 districts around the country. Um, and my role is to work with all those 23 districts, um, help them to develop programming that they pass on to their members um, in an effort to transform their buildings um, and uh, become better stewards. Um, so we, uh, I, I work with those 23 districts and and, and any other groups that are coming online, uh, hoping to start uh, 2030 districts in, in other parts of the country, so. And good morning or afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, my name is Michael Lake. I'm the president and CEO of Leading Cities. We're headquartered here in Boston. Um, we are a global nonprofit organization that drives resiliency and sustainability for all by unlocking the potential of, of the world's cities. 
Um, I actually got my start uh, in the federal government. I've served three different presidents and ultimately realized that uh, the rubber meets the road at the local level. Um, so I now work with cities globally um, to enact change, uh, including uh, the built environment. Um, and uh, we, we take on issues. Uh, I, I loved Corey's opening here, but we take on issues that range from uh, equity and sustainability to resiliency and um, long-term impact uh, for communities. So uh, I'm delighted to be here. I do want to thank Corey and Will and uh, Wade and Kareen uh, for the amazing job that they've done to bring us all together. And I'm looking forward to this panel. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Aishwarya Narayana. I'm the Director of Conscious Design Development at the Center for Conscious Design, which is the home of Conscious Cities Movement. I'm also the lab lead at Hume, which is a science-informed design practice. Uh, my background is in architecture, neuroesthetics, and experimental psychology. Here's a small video to present to you guys what Conscious Cities are really, really about. Corinne. We're all familiar with stories of the golem from Prague and Frankenstein, inanimate objects injected with life. These are example of things becoming conscious, the quality or state of being aware, especially of something within oneself. Could we do the same to our cities? We're already busy making them more efficient and productive. We make them smarter by using technology to interact with services and organizations, channeling data from one point to another. There's an even greater amount of information being produced that expresses our day-to-day -day lives. We mark out routes, post photos, write about experiences, tweet our thoughts, and on the most part with the intention of being seen and heard. We're producing a constant stream of expression. What if a city became aware of this information and began to make sense of what's going on inside of itself? It could combine a huge amount of data with a growing body of knowledge of how we experience our built environment. One that is continuously being updated by the behavioral and brain sciences. Take for example a study revealing that some city streets cause increased cognitive load. This happens when the levels of stimuli in our surroundings are too high, overwhelming our brain systems. It has adverse effects such as depleting our attention capacity and is thought to weaken functions such as self-control. Imagine if the city became aware of the times when a problematic street is overloaded with stimuli and helped adapt it to our benefits. But it doesn't all need to be instant changes. There are semi-permanent improvements that a conscious city could make according to patterns of behavior. It could encourage playful learning for children outside of school or offer more opportunities for interaction in areas where the old suffer from loneliness. We already know that we can design spaces and environments that affect our mood and behavior, even if until recently our understanding was anecdotal. From monuments that inspire awe to department stores that disconnect us from time, We've began to use advances in psychology and neuroscience to improve environments like hospitals and schools. And this is possible at any scale. We have an opportunity to improve our well-being through architecture and urban design that better consider our needs. We should make sure that new knowledge is used right so that our cities become healthier, more inclusive and democratic. And we can do this by building conscious cities. Hi, I'm Victoria Sandville uh, with LG. I think I'm the last panelist here. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I am the national sales manager for the public sector. Uh, my background actually is in government, just like Michael's is uh, from the congressional side, uh, uh, working on appropriations and guiding funds to municipalities um, to use in smart spaces and how you connect, how you leverage technology to create um, what we're all working towards here and what we're talking about. Um, the role of LG in all of this is, um, as you may know, you may have a, an appliance or a TV uh, in your home or in your office, but we're uh, LG Electronics is a $60 billion company. 
Um, in addition to TVs and appliances, uh, we're one of the largest solar panel manufacturers. Um, we're leading the edge in storage, and, and you may know of LG Chem um, from the battery perspective for EV charging as well as energy storage. Um, and we're going into new realms with IoT and robots. Um, the biggest thing that we want to make sure that we're uh, providing as a resource, as a technology provider, is when we go and work with governments and, and educational institutions, is bringing that whole one LG spectrum into one space. So think of us as kind of the spoke uh, to the 63 subsidiaries um, at LG to really access those technologies to practically apply the vision of a smart community or a smart space. So thanks for having me. Hey, thank you all. Um, just to jump right into it, I wanted to pose one quick question for all of you and then we'll kind of roll from there. Uh, with the growing, growing reality of climate change, increased frequency of natural disasters, decreasing health and well-being of our general population, um, the increase in inequity in and inequality, and a continued pressure of urbanization, what key role will smart buildings and smart infrastructure play in the, the future of resilient cities? And that's open for anyone to... Oh. I'll jump on in first because I'm sure um, I've got kind of the technology practical aspect of it. Um, so that may, might make most sense for me to go first on this. Um, buildings as a whole uh, and a role, whether it's climate change, natural disasters, um, mental health connectivity, um, the role that smart buildings play is um, essentially how you design them, right? Um, you know, when you look at the future of buildings, you need to think about what's going to happen practically in a building from the collaboration aspect, um, from the operational efficiency aspect, and from the experiential aspect. So um, we at LG, we work with a lot of architects and consultants on making sure that all three of those buckets are combined in a building design at the beginning stages of a discussion, um, instead of maybe having the experiential um, aspect at the end. Um, and so if you think about energy loads, um, you want an architecture community when they're working with a government institution or a community um, to make sure, okay, so if we're going to reduce the energy load in a building, um, but then also increase connectivity and collaboration um, for equity, you know, uh, within a community. How do we balance, how do we use technologies and design that into buildings to reduce the energy load reduce um, uh, the, uh, the dependence on the grid, um, while also then bringing in these much more um, complicated technologies uh, to make sure that they access, they allow community access for collaboration and development. So I always say it's really interesting. A lot of people think about smart buildings and they just think about um, just the plumbing at first, but I always wanna make sure you think about the whole design and the role that the building is playing from the beginning stages, as opposed to pulling in narratives at the end. Um, so that's kind of how we would think uh, buildings as a whole would play into this space. So maybe I'll jump in and, and give a slightly different perspective on the city side of things. I mean, at Leading Cities, we really have a human-centric approach to the work that we do. And the reality is that the average person will spend about 90% of their life in a building, um, one building or another. Um, so just the impact that that building has or those buildings have on our, our experiences uh, is important to us. Um, but to pick up on one of the things that Victoria said about you know, energy consumption, I mean, it's no surprise to any of us uh, that energy, uh, that buildings are huge uh, consumers of energy. Uh, in fact, around the world, it's about 30% of energy uh, is spent in buildings. And in cities specifically, it's as high as 70%. They also produce in cities 30% of our carbon emissions. Um, so depending on the city you're looking at, when, and you look at CO2 emissions, uh, either the buildings or the, the traffic or vehicles uh, are the one or second, number one or number two producer of, of carbon emissions in any city. This all has obviously a huge impact on, on, on the planet, uh, but it also uh, has a tremendous opportunity uh, for cities. Uh, 
Now, one of the things that we talk to our city governments a lot about is the fact that neither of those two things, buildings or vehicles, uh, the two biggest emitters of carbon uh, emissions in a city are predominantly owned by cities. Um, sure, they own some buildings and some vehicles, uh, but this is very much a public-private uh, collaborative effort. Again, building on what Victoria was talking about, you have to be collaborative in, in our approach to this. But ultimately, we see buildings as the biggest opportunity um, to, to turn a smitty, city into a smart city. Um, and, and whether that is starts with one building uh, and eventually the rest of the city follows uh, because buildings have that ability to stand alone um, and to be a smart community into itself. Um, but it also, as you, as you uh, build these buildings uh, or retrofit buildings, um, you increase the opportunities for other smart city technologies like smart microgrids uh, as another example. And so to, to answer your cor question, Corey, um, I just see buildings as, as really a huge foundational building block on which smart cities can be built and will be built. And I, I can, this is Dave, and I can pick up where Michael left off. I, he used the word collaboration. You know, what a 2030 district is really all about is uh, building owners, managers, uh, institutional investors in a particular city uh, getting together. Um, and one of the things we found that's it's unique about it is it, these aren't um, driven by municipal governance. They're driven by those owners and, and managers. So uh, those owners and managers and investors are sitting down in a room and working together to come up with solutions that work for them, that, that work in their market. So um, the, the beauty of, of this, this model is that it's, uh, that it's um, has the, the underpinnings of the architecture 2030 uh, goals, which are out there for saving energy, water, and transportation emissions, um, but it's different in every city and it's driven by the particular market, uh, but it's all about a collaboration. And, and what we found is, is buildings are getting together. Um, they're all striving towards those same goals. Um, they oftentimes, uh, we've talked to um, building owners and, in particular cities, it's, it's a one one forum where they have a chance to sit down together with their um, um, their competitors and, and talk about making positive changes within their community. Um, so again, that, that collaboration aspect, I think, is what is so important uh, about uh, the, the model that we have. So, um, so actually, I mean, adding to what Victoria, Michael, and Dave said, but on a different plane, though. It's evident from decades of research that has happened in psychology and neuroscience about human experience that we are actually beginning to see empirical proof for uh, the paradigm of inactivism and embodied cognition, which basically posits that human sentience and cognition actually arises from a dynamic interaction between people and environment. Now, this is quite different and quite an advancement from the classical theories of cognition, which have actually wrongfully assumed that our brains are like computers that linearly process spaces more as visual stimuli, uh, all to form mental models and representations of reality. But inactivism actually focuses on a dialogue and a dialogue which can be built with people to focus on their intentionality and to actually build that dialogue into space. Unfortunately, smart cities discourse uh, refer to classical model of human experience and if and when they do talk about people at all. Um, and otherwise, it tends to focus on sustainability as a principle to connect uh, and consume. Uh, but then at the end of the day, when smart cities do talk about uh, deploying IoT, I guess their best bet is to have a reactive and a responsive uh, environment in a physical and an ecological sense. But um, they fail to address the questions of people's subjective experience right, at the given cross section of space time. So they fail the social and psychological dimensions of our city which kind of leaves the whole concept less than prepared to address equity, intersubjectivity, agency, well-being, and active awareness, et cetera, which are actually the guiding principles of our very social existence and which define our ever-changing relationships with the surroundings, both built and natural. I think that's a, a great place to kind of kick off. We, you know, one, one, well, there's, there's a couple of things that, that I heard from each of you. One, was really around 
the experience, the human centric side of, of what we're doing when we're starting to talk about smart cities. The other side is the, the kind of, uh, let's say the in, uh, iterative steps that will be required for us to move into uh, a, a new kind of paradigm of, of built cities. Um, I think that that's kind of a, a foundational component for us to think through, which is the majority of the infrastructure, the majority of the systems, whether they be the perception or the construct of what an office is versus you know, the power grid. These are institutions that, that are part of what we do or part of what we believe we should do in terms of urban development that have been around for over a century. And so when we take a step back and start to think about a smart city as a responsive and interactive uh, and engaged participant in the, the way that, that we operate, right? The way that a city, a building, uh, even we as people operate, um, where do you see the, the kind of uh, quickest advances that, that we can make? Where are the, the kind of most immediate, the low hanging fruit opportunities for us as architects to help drive that change? I actually have a prompt. Uh, are we as architects and designers, are we best equipped to deal with problems that actually might be very far away from us in every way? Just a prompt. Might be the wrong crowd to make that, but still. Well, I guess I'll jump in. That's an interesting prompt. Um, I'm not an architect, so I actually can't answer that question. Um, but what we've seen from the, the te technology perspective, honestly, is, um, you know, we have a lot of communities that come to us with great ideas. We want to start a smart city. We want to build a smart city. Um, and I think that there's comments on, you know, do we really consider the human aspect of it first, right? We don't. Um, and, and I think um, the other panelists, they've uh, made recommendations, you know, every city is different, every goal is different, and you really need an organized construct of architects, um, uh, community organizers, um, municipality leaders, uh, uh, educational institutions, all in the same room to really decide what that plan may be. Um, but then when the low-hanging fruit comes in, uh, we've talked about this with AIA uh, significantly from a technology perspective, low-hanging fruit is a short-term wins. Right? As, as each community decides what their definition of a smart space, whether it be a room building uh, city is. Um, so, but the short term wins though, can prove the concept of building out the framework to, to the larger piece of developing a smart city. So what we see is un, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, um, what we see is the energy consumption and the energy efficiency and renewable energy and storage piece of it that's low hanging fruit. Um, where maybe it's energy efficient lighting in the streets. Maybe you test an IT, IoT sensor that's uh, traveling from the building to the car to the street furniture structure. Um, but with that low hanging fruit, if you have energy savings or operational savings that are created, you can build those savings into the longer term plan of, okay, taking savings here and then deploying that to improving the human experience. Again, which is subjective, right? But that's the ultimate goal. So create the savings, um, support the grid, maybe reduce the dependence on the grid, but then take this, take this savings and put this towards the equity development piece of it. Um, so, and it's just like typical what you do right now in military facilities. A lot of times they're deploying renewable energy. That savings created goes to warfighter training and simulation training. So cities can, can think of that the same way with their multiple uh, key stakeholders. I, I would say, well, to, to combine, I guess, both questions here. I also am not an architect, but uh, I do think architects have a tremendously powerful opportunity uh, in the development of, of our built environment. And uh, in terms of low hanging fruit, I and mean, we talked about um, energy consumption or conservation, um, I think that's one of the, the low hanging fruits simply because the ROI is so obvious. Um, so you can make the business case for it. Much like with, with many cities, the low hanging fruit, as Victoria mentioned, were LED streetlights. And that's because the payback period was like two years or even less. 
uh, so you could, could make the justification for the investment. With architects and, and the new buildings that are being developed in our cities, uh, and again, in Boston, we, we right now are experiencing the, the uh, biggest building boom that the city has ever experienced. So we're literally reshaping the city as we speak. Um, and, and an architect has that ability to envision what the future of, of the city is gonna look like. And, uh, you know, LED lights and sensors and all these things, these, you know, gadgets and gizmos, they, they're gonna have their impact, but they will not be around as long as the buildings we're building. Um, so I think that uh, in the end, um, when we talk about shaping the future of cities, you, you can't ignore the role an architect plays in literally designing what the future of that city, or at least a component of that city will look like and how it acts, how it interacts. Um, and I do think that there's other ROI for, for um, real estate developers, uh, property managers, et cetera, in terms of uh, the reduced cost of energy makes that one building slightly more attractive than another. Um, have, so the save the cost savings, I guess. Uh, but there's also the increase in performance and the the comfort that people experience in a building that is more um, regulated in terms of its heating and cooling controls. Um, its safety in terms of air purification uh, within the building. Uh, or air filtration within a building, especially in times like this. And of course, all of these things can, can re, uh, ultimately result in, in less vacancy because you've created greater demand for particular structures, particular office space or whatever it might be. So I, I think that uh, uh, architects do have a huge role to play. And I would assume, uh, again, not, not being an architect or, or not being a real estate developer, but the lowest hanging fruit to me seems like the those that you can make the strongest uh, business case for uh, and, and make that argument for an, a clear ROI. Yeah, and, and uh, our, our 2030 districts are, we really are addressing that low hanging fruit. We were working with those existing buildings. That's one of the things we're doing, but um, you know, we're working with developers pushing them to meet the, the ambitious goals of, of trying to reach net zero by 2030. And then we're trying to take this next step of figuring out how these organizations can help develop smart cities. And honestly, we don't have that answer yet. You know, we're, we are doing a better job at working with the individuals. Um, and the, the nice thing is that all of our organizations work with the municipalities. So the, those partners are at the table. So we're trying to piece together how best do we approach the smart city uh, um, uh, as, as the, the next uh, avenue for us. So. Perfect. I'm going to take a complete 180 here and, and look at it. You know, I, I think a lot of the short term, the, the low hanging fruit is stuff that, that is in our purview. It, it's, it's an efficiency or an effectiveness gain in relationship to what we already know, right? So we're, we're looking at it in the context of, of traditional benchmarks, whether that be consumption, production, uh, or, or investment versus return. Um, the, the, well, redefining resiliency of a city requires that we share a common perspective, a car, common goal for what those outcomes look like. I, I, I think the 2030 commitment is, is kind of the start of that in the context of, um, in the context of, uh, again, benchmarks against performance that will get us to a more sustainable, more consciously environmental development. If we take this back to a human centric or a, a, a human centric approach to cities, then resiliency really does start to play a, or have a different definition of how regulation, how development, um, is, is done, right? And, and it does change what we do. You know, I, I, I always like to refer to all of the work that's going into autonomous vehicles, right? It's, it's being built to the constraints of urban planning, street planning and circulation that has existed, you know, since Ford started building cars. But the reality is that urban development needs to change to adapt to the future where autonomous cars are providing a different opportunity for mobility.
where in the realm of resiliency and sustainability is our moonshot? What are the key factors that we need to start thinking about uh, kind of disconnected from the systems, from the infrastructure, and from the standards that are already in place? Well, um, mine, will, mine will probably be, my answer will be the least interesting, I think, but, um, and it's, I don't know if you would define this Corey as moonshot, but um, I saw a comment in the chat box about, you know, kind of technology in general. And um, honestly, one thing that would be critical to a moonshot is uh, to, to remove the first cost focus on the design, regardless of if it's technology or buildings or the human experience in it. Um, and really start focusing on total ownership cost, right? So that if you think about what's, what, what we experienced in the past year, um, you know, we have, uh, LG makes variable refrigerant flow technology. If more schools had focused on investing in this more higher efficiency technology, um, students would be actually in a building learning and there wouldn't be that that current like equity divide in, in learning right now, right in a space. So, and, and you can kind of apply that in terms of um, investment in technology and how that enables how humans experience uh, the community in general across the board. So I would say, I know it's not as interesting, but really uh, driving total cost of ownership as opposed to first cost will then probably gear us towards achieving those goals on uh, you know, what you guys would def define as moonshot um, for smart communities of the future. So Corey, for your question about uh, resiliency, one of the things that we have been thinking about at uh, the CCD is what's the smallest unit that we can actually create an impact for and an impact on? right? Uh, and this becomes more and more important when we think about concepts like resiliency, because we can always say that a city is as resilient as the communities living in it and the communities in, in inhabiting it. But then I guess every natural disaster or every set of crises, they present very different opportunities for people to adapt to, right? So in that scenario, I guess my question is, what is that smallest unit that we can actually design for, especially when we talk about infrastructure to support and promote and even evolve resiliency in the long term? Well, if I, if I can build on that, coming back to my earlier point, I, I think what makes smart buildings such a powerful tool in the smart city toolkit is that they can be standalone small units, um, whether it's a single ho home or a skyscraper, it doesn't make a difference, um, but it can have a profound impact. And uh, even choosing where we uh, locate a building, I mean, not, this is getting into more of a real estate uh, question here, but the reality is 90% of the world's cities are coastal cities, which means sea level rise is a tremendous threat to a city's resiliency. Um, I will say this about my hometown here in Boston, we've just built a one of the largest, uh, the largest real estate development project uh, on the Eastern seaboard, still underway under construction, um, but the whole area is, a huge threat against uh, sea level rise. Um, so does that really make the most sense? And, and have we constructed those buildings to withstand that, that uh, potential threat? Um, so I think that it's a great question you ask about what is the smallest unit? I think buildings could be one of them. And we have, of course, there's another whole topic here, Corey, about new construction versus retrofit here. Um, but uh, either way, um, these are building blocks that ultimately make up a city. And I mean, who, who doesn't think of a skyline when you think of a city? Or who doesn't think of a, a particular landmark building when you think of a city? Cities, I mean, buildings are what define cities in many ways. Um, and it's, it can be a very small unit for us to start with. Well, and and I, I don't know, just a moonshot, but uh, you know, from a perspective of um, architects, et cetera, you know, if every building was net zero or, or met the living building challenge, um, you know, we'd be there, right? Um, and, and start transforming all of our existing buildings to those standards as well. That's, it's a moonshot, but. 
Perfect. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's, it's kind of interesting when we start thinking about the opportunities for new developments are, you know, dwindling, right? The, the, the reality is that our investment in sustainable and resilient cities is going to be in the current stock of buildings. Um, and that's a, a completely different mind shift from, you know, the, the greenfield project to retrofitting with new systems, with, with new constraints. Um, I guess one question before we go to audience, um, the, the opportunity in smart cities to connect, um, let's say the, the physical systems with the digital systems, right? To create awareness about the dependency on not necessarily just the technology. You know, if you look at things like infrastructure, um, you know, the power grid's a perfect example uh, of, of inefficiency even as we make buildings more efficient, um, we're still dependent on a, on a, a system that's, that's inefficient in itself. Um, you know, AC, DC uh, the translations, you know, the, the tie back to bi-directional power production. Um, how do we start to negotiate that private and public partnership that is needed to, to really uh, take advantage of not just technology, but a changing understanding and, and a changing uh, commitment to improving the, the, the built environment. I mean, I think it, it, a lot of it starts with, as I think was said earlier about common goals um, and, and starting that discussion early. I, I, I'll pick up a little bit on what I was just hinting at a minute ago with the retrofits versus you know existing stock versus new stock of buildings and the various technologies that exist. It's obviously much easier to uh, build from scratch um, with all the latest and greatest. But the reality is we have so much already built that needs to be incorporated into this concept, this vision of a smart city. Um, one thing that comes to mind, we one of the programs that we run is a global uh, smart city startup accelerator program. And we've had a and that last year's edition had a company come through that creates uh, grass seed. Um, now, the, it was actually created to conserve water. And so instead of having about inch and a half long roots, it grows almost four feet long roots. So it's pretty much evergreen. You, once you water it, you, I mean, once you establish it, you know, with the exception of droughts, never have to water it again. I like my favorite part is that you only have to mow it twice a year. Um, but the reason I'm mentioning this is that they discovered that this particular um, grass can actually be used for uh, green roofs. One of the big challenges with green roofs, of course, in, in existing buildings is the weight. Um, but because of the, the root system that this particular grass grows, you only need two and a half inches of, of soil, reducing the weight by as much as 40%. Um, so it makes any building um, a candidate for a green roof. So I guess part of my, my comment here is just to say that we do have to look at these new technologies. We don't know where they're coming from. I mean, that was, that was a, a product that was developed for lawns to reduce uh, the amount of water being wasted uh, to keep our lawns green. And it ended up with, in addition to that, green roofs for retro uh, fits. Um, I think we, we have um, so many opportunities, even in new construction, another, just given another quick example, another company we've worked with is called Carbon Upcycling. Uh, they sequester carbon, uh, turn it into an additive to concrete, which creates a 40% increase in the strength of the concrete uh, while embedding five to 15% of carbon uh, CO2 embedded right into it. Um, so it's reducing carbon, and increasing the strength uh, of the concrete at the same time. There's a world of opportunities out there, I guess is my point here. And um, the, the biggest challenge is, is finding the connectivity, the collaboration and whatnot to bring those innovative solutions to the folks, whether it's on the city side, on the construction side, on the development side, et cetera, uh, the architectural side to know that these solutions exist and to incorporate them into our plans, whether for existing buildings or new construction. 
if I can just piggyback on that, um, because this kind of sparked something that comes up a lot with us when we're talking with communities about smart city development. Um, there's so many cool technologies out there, right? Uh, and if we had all the money in the world um, and there was no you know, restrictions, we would do it. Um, but, but I think the missing component to a lot of this, and this is something we've been working with community leaders on as well as developers on, is how can we then leverage the investment in these technologies even further beyond the building, um, but then the experience of the, and the goals of the community? And, and to kind of dive deeper into that, um, I think about workforce goals. Like what is a community, wh what kind of workforce do they wanna develop? And again, it's gonna be different for every community. And if you can then tie in the investment in these new technologies and buildings or spaces, maybe then there's a community program that can be developed so that you're training a workforce for the future, whether it's like in renewable energy or resiliency, or if it's collaboration and technology. And a very simple application of that as a low hanging fruit is when you, install newer, more cool, like all the technology that Michael was just talking about, again, back into a school system. And then maybe there's a VOTEC program where then you teach those students um, how to either build or maintain or apply in other applications within the community. So again, just a tiny small nugget, but I think that a lot of times there are tremendous opportunities to tie all these sorts of cool technologies, like for example, direct view LED technology and what the future holds in that in design um, into how the community not only experiences it, but how it can build its own little future for themselves, um, you know, and be successful in the community. So just, just a tiny thought there. Actually adding to what Victoria just mentioned about empowering communities and giving them a set of tools to actually take up the solutions in their own hands because they are the ones who understand their problems the best. Uh, that is one of the points that I wanted to make actually when you spoke about partnerships. Uh, I think 2030 does talk about including community stakeholders in the entire uh, process, I guess. But then my question then is that when we talk about a top-down process, a top-down change, and we talk about creating partnerships, where exactly are we looking at? I mean, we end up looking at the bell curve in the center, as of course, of a homogenous population, because those are, the, those are the kind of conclusions that we can draw from the kind of data that we collect. But what about heterogeneous populations, which is what most of the cities have? I mean, in that case, how do we really distribute, well, uh, intent and agency, and also sort of give them an opportunity to feel like they have a say in what the cities are developing as. I mean, how do we sort of create this dialogue between the grassroots and the partnerships that form in, uh, in the middle of the grassroots and the governments that actually sort of enforce planning? Perfect, I think we're gonna go ahead and open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, Will, did you have somebody lined up? Yeah, let's go to Casey. Casey, if you don't mind, uh... You typed your, your question in the chat, but go ahead and ask it directly. We'll include you in the program here. Yeah, sure. Hey, guys, how's it going? Uh, thanks for the, the discussion so far. It's been really fascinating. I think I've got somewhat of a, a two-parter. The first one was really just uh, one-upping Victoria's point around the real technology that can make a real difference right now. Um, and I, I think as an architect and a technology provider, um, I think the plan for the future and how all this technology works out like perfectly uh, at once it once it can be deployed is often the enemy of like getting good viable tools like in people's hands right now to make an impactful difference. Uh, but one of the things that uh, this conversation brought to mind is um, everything's been discussed as sort of like from a planning perspective at the scale of a city you know, getting engagement, fostering engagement and fostering sort of resiliency and inclusion. But what are the actual tools and like frameworks by which like all of the technologies that we're talking about, the smarts of these buildings and cities and environments that we're talking about actually using and leveraging, like to, to get at resolution here, right? Because I think this is something that has hindered the smart building smart cities movement for decades is talking about how easy it will be to connect all these things but then like only having little pilots here and there that are kind of more one-offs than they are realities 
Well, actually, Casey, to your point, uh, no matter how much data we end up collecting, no, no matter how many people we end up connecting, the conclusions that we draw are only going to be applicable to a few, and we, can, we can't really generalize it to a larger population because inherently every person's experience is subjective. What's the point in connecting them using any kind of smart technology? So if I could just put a counter back back to you on, on that one, right? Like, I mean, that argument, that's a circular argument, in my opinion, because that's just an argument for not doing anything then, right? Like cities have evolved over thousands of years um, as a function of like individuals aggregating sort of decisions that are being made. And it's a similar challenge that we have here, right? From a top down or bottom up approach or middle out, however you want to frame what the right framing of a solution is. Um, like, yes, there will be people that are included and excluded from the decisions that are being made, but that shouldn't hamper us from like establishing a framework, a direction, a guiding principle towards what that is. But coming to common cause around those guiding principles, I think is the kinds of frameworks that your teams are engaging in uh, are, are what I'm asking. Like how you're facilitating that, what they are, where they're published, how the general public like gets included in that conversation. But I guess it was not a circular argument if you think about embedding feedback loops, right? If you create those connections between the right kind of param parameters that can be modified in an environment dynamically given the feedback of people, then maybe we're not really making a circular circular argument as much as we are just trying to figure out what's the best way to collect data from people that actually matter. So I, I would say this is an area that we we have not mastered. Um, there's a lot happening, as you said, from the grassroots up, from the top down, from the middle out. Um, but I can give you some examples of some of the things that, that have been done or haven't been done. Um, so for instance, from the top down, when you look to, to Europe, for instance, there has been massive investments in this smart city concept. Um, tremendous grants, uh, you know, fed, uh, uh, EU funded grants. You don't have that kind of, of support here in the US. Um, in the uh, 2000, I think it was 2017 Congress or whatever, um, there was a bill put forward for a billion dollars, uh, which is still a fraction of what they're doing in Europe, a billion dollars over five years. Um, it didn't get it out of uh, committee. Uh, it was resubmitted in the, in the following Congress. Still hasn't become uh, an investment that our federal government is making. Obviously, we've had a major shift in, in policy and leadership in the, in the country, so that maybe that will have a chance. But I would say that a billion dollars over five years is, is barely scratching the surface. So from the top down, we need more, um, more leadership and more buy-in into what this is and the federal government's role in supporting it. From the bottom up, one of the things that Leading Cities has been uh, part of locally, internationally, is this whole concept of participatory budgeting. Um, and given resident, giving residents of a city the opportunity to determine how part of that city budget is, is uh, spent. Uh, for, Boston had a, its own twist to, to this concept and, and created what they call the youth budget, which they set aside a million dollars, obviously not a tremendous amount of money, uh, but it's a million dollars that the students or the young people of the city uh, choose how that's spent. Now they've bought iPads, upgraded uh, playgrounds, et cetera. Um, but that kind of, of um, support from the community can be applied in this, in this same uh, discussion. Um, and from the middle out, I, I've mentioned some of the startups that are um, working on solutions. I mean, we've all heard the expression, no matter what it is, there's an app for that. The truth is, no matter what it is, there's probably a startup for that. And that includes just about everything in the smart city space. Um, so there are people who are working, uh, I mean, incredibly hard uh, to develop these solutions. Reality is it's not easy to bring that uh, solution to market, especially when you're talking about the public sector and the public procurement process. And it's just not conducive to, um, innovation or startups. 
Um, so there's definitely a lot of work that we need to be doing on a systemic level uh, to make it more welcoming, um, or more possible even. And that's some of the work that Leading Cities is very focused on. Uh, but I, I think overall, uh, there's so much momentum, even if it's not, uh, not seen, uh, there is still exists so much momentum from the grassroots up, from the top down, and from the middle out, uh, and all over the world. Um, so I'm hopeful of what, what can come out of all of that. If I can just make one additional comment to um, the previous comments. Um, I think the biggest gaping hole um, in this whole uh, kind of strategy is, and what we actually need to challenge back our communities with is the role of the Economic Development Office at the county level. Um, if you look at any other development that's happened in the past 20 or 30 years in communities where maybe they've, they, you know, a community has set a goal for itself is we're going to target this particular uh, industry to come uh, and they'll build factories in our community. Or we want to build, we want to be known as like the highest density R&D education institutions. The economic development workforce office is key to organizing all that from community leaders aspect, from the startups that Michael mentioned, to the educational institutions, to that partnership and community. So um, every time that LG is approached on, hey, we want to build a smart city and um, we'd love you to be a part of it. Our first question is, is your economic development office organized and do they have a framework and a plan ready? And if they do, um, yes, let's get started. Um, so I would advise, honestly, architects and consultants that are approached with the same big ideas, encourage economic development workforce groups to be involved from the start. They're the ones that are going to build the framework. They'll build the business case um, for federal investment, right? Um, but again, federal investment only happens and with matching funds, right, for local and state. So, so again, that's just my two cents on that. Uh, that's what I, I would recommend for framework purposes. And, and I would just echo exactly what Michael and Victoria said, because I am working with the grassroots and there's a lot of movement and there's a lot of frustration among building owners and the, the grassroots saying they want to do this, but they don't understand how to tie it all together. Um, so that's what needs to happen. So I, I'd agree with that. Perfect. And I think we'll go to Manfred next. Well. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, I'm, I'm from here, from Hawaii, so I haven't shaved yet. <laughs> we had two hours beer and we just had my morning coffee. Well, thank you so much also. Like I, I wanted to jump over my, Victoria. She's really speaking from my heart. And we actually we are actually working with uh, economic development. And we are a company, we are combining the, the physical work, uh, the physical uh, environment with workforce development. And uh, so productivity. And so what she was writing first about uh, the, uh, you know, the total ownership, that's actually, I would like to, to share ex experience what I did. I've, I've been doing uh, development of smart building uh, technologies for a long time, specifically energy. And then a couple of years back, <clears throat> I realized that actually when you, when you look at uh, the cost of doing business for uh, the people who actually have to invest in this kind of stuff, it's about 90% payroll and 1% energy. <clears throat> so when you come actually to somebody said, hey, you know, I found an assist, it might be a little bit more expensive, but it can save you 20 or 30% uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, energy. Again, I'm not, I'm all for like energy. This is crucial for us. Climate change is the thing, but how do we sell? Because we have also have to have a competitive edge. You know, Victoria has to sell her, her products. We actually have to sell our, our design services. So <clears throat> when it comes down to there and, and see, you know, that, that building, uh, the building owners, they might be interested in, in energy, but if you shift over to the, to the occupants, the tenants, and the, the, the businesses, for them, the biggest gain will be like, again, in, in productivity. So that actually totally eclipses, you know, the, the savings of, uh, of, 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 of energy. So that's actually right now what we are working on. And so I'm, I'm, I'm you know, it's total ownership. It's not very, uh, it's not abstract. If you want to land, you know, specifically right now with all these changes in, in, in real estate and, you know, the people are working from home somewhere, much less uh, demand for commercial spaces 
this will be an issue to come up. And so we, I'm, I'm happy, Victoria, that you, you mentioned workforce and, 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 and uh, the, the quality of healthy, safe and, and, and productive environment. So that's actually very dear to our heart. And I think it's, uh, it will actually help us all as building designers and, and we are selling our, our, our products. And, and uh, so this, this will actually help us to, in, in our endeavor to, to, to sell it. Thanks, Manfred. I'm going to make one comment and I'm going to then pull in Michael Lake into this. Um, you know, it's our responsibility from LG's perspective that we need to arm you with the data when you're developing um, these buildings on wh why this investment is worth it from a technology perspective. But then tying it beyond just like, oh, yeah, it's going to save you money in your building. Michael had said earlier, it's also who is going to reside in that building eventually? Who's going to, you know, is that developer going to flip? that building. And, and in some cases, if you look at, I, I reside right outside of Manhattan, um, is there a revenue share component on the energy savings to a tenant's um, uh, lease, right? Um, it, it's all those sorts of things that we as a technology company are responsible for arming you with, but then also feeding those lessons learned back to the workforce, the economic development people who are going to develop frameworks on how to sell this. So sorry, Michael, to put you on the spot, but when you said that, I, that was near and dear to my heart. So I <laughs> just wanted to add on to that. No, it, it, it's such a critical thing. Um, you know, I, well, first of all, Manfred, I have to tell you, I'm sitting here in Boston in the middle of the snowstorm. So I'm quite jealous, uh, even though you're just having your morning coffee. Uh, I, I, I used, don't know that I used, point. I used to live in Boston. Oh. Memorial Drive 100, this big red building for, I was, working for an MIT spin-off there. It was two miserable winters there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're living through another one now. Um, but I, just to, to your point and to Victoria's point, I, I mean, this, this really is, is a critical component to this because it drives so much of what we're talking about. Um, and I, I just, if I can just go off on a little bit of a tangent here and say that um, the, my, what I started to say earlier, what we're not doing well is, is bringing all of these pieces together. Um, and it's not so easy. Um, w one of the things that attracts me to the whole concept of smart or resilient cities is how comprehensive it is. Um, but the challenge in that is, is the classic too many chefs, you know, spoiling the stew kind of situation. Um, so it, it's really a very difficult balance. And I'll be honest, I don't think anybody has mastered it, um, but it's, it's something that I think literally every single day, every new project that comes on board or online, every new technology that's developed, we literally inch closer and closer and closer. And it makes for an uncomfortable uh, transition period that we're going through now. But once we all get there, um, I think all these pieces that are so disparate right now will be so interconnected um, that that total, you know, outlook um, and that comprehensive approach will, will make sense and we'll start wondering how we ever did it any differently before. <laughs> Perfect. And I see Jeff put a question in the chat there, but we just wanted to give him the, the opportunity to go ahead and ask it live. And this this will be our last question so that we can keep on schedule. If you're still there, Jeff, you can have the stage. All right, maybe I can just read it for you all then. <clears throat> During the COVID pandemic, there's been grassroots work done by architects and the building community, oftentimes as pro bono work trying to help businesses, restaurants, for example, to create outside dining. Is there some place for companies to engage in these triage efforts as prototyping and gaining acceptance for smart cities development? Hmm, okay, uh, I'll, I'll try to tackle this first. It's a really important part in, uh, point in this time, um, though, even prior to COVID, there's other emergency response um, opportunities out there that you know, kind of companies are always asked about. 
the best lesson LG has learned in this, honestly, is uh, for prototyping is to work within the local design community. Um, where we find the best success is the architects that are working with like maybe a local university and their design and construction school. Um, a perfect example for us is we're working with University of Florida's design and construction school on um, a prototype of like a smart uh, manufactured home for uh, emergency response, um, as well as then taking that and building a community from that. So um, that's where the architecture expertise locally meets the government because it's a HUD and a DOE project, meets the designers of the future, meets, meets and pulls in the technology resources. So that's something we found successful, um, though um, at times like this, every case is unique. I, would, I, would, uh, I was just going to say that I, I think sometimes uh, cities are the ones that can organize uh, that. For instance, in Boston, we have the mayor's office of New Urban Mechanics, which is a, a kind of a go-to spot. Um, in other communities, it's it's nonprofit organizations like leading cities. The, the answer, I, unfortunately, I think is there is no one single answer to this question. Um, and um, though there probably should be, because it would be a far more efficient approach. Um, I think because of the, the, the various uh, differences with cities and communities, it just doesn't exist on a, on a universal scale, to my knowledge, at least. That's a, an unfortunate and, and great way to end this session. Um, and, and in general, right, there's no real one way for us to, to move forward. And I think that's that's really the goal of today's conversation is to, to set the context, set the opportunities and really see what are the, the you know, what are the, the, the buckets, what are the verticals we can go after that really are impactful. So with that, I just really wanna thank all of our panelists for, um, for your contribution, your expertise, your insight into how, um, how we can really start to impact um, sustainability and resiliency in, in our cities.